I'm going to talk today about congenital torticollis. Um, I advance my slides. Oh, works better if I don't do it. Okay. Um, so torticollis is just by definition the preference to look more to one side than the other. It's something we commonly see in the office. As a physiatrist, I see this quite regularly. Um, what I wanted to talk today was a little bit about what is it and who gets it, but also more the downslide consequences and what we can do to prevent. Because from a developmental standpoint, this is something that hopefully most kids will do better with a little bit of therapy and time. And I find that the persistent ones, there's other issues going on that can be addressed through parent education, um, positioning. So the cause is mostly musculoskeletal. That's the easiest part to treat. The idea is that they get tight on one side of the neck. It leaves the baby's head at a tilt. They're rotating to the opposite side, especially if it's involving the muscle, the sternocleidomastoid. Um, that action on, so if the right side is tight, it's gonna tip the head to the right and turn the head to the left. Um, opposite if it's the other side. You can have other muscles involved, um, the trapezius, some of the other neck muscles can be involved, but this is the most typical picture. There are other causes of torticollis, such as ocular. Um, in this instance, the child's trying to improve either visual resolution or adopt the head position to optimize seeing, not seeing double vision. So it's either extraocular muscles or some sort of astigmatism. These are much less common reasons in the, in the a new infant who we're seeing a tightness in a turn, we typically think it's more musculoskeletal. And then the last main reason that I always keep top of mind is if it's skeletal, such as a hemivertebrae, in which case these kids often aren't able to correct, they kind of always stay in that tip tilted position. Um, these children, by definition, if it's congenital, they are born with it. There are some other versions of acquired that I will save for another time. This is more common in the firstborn. It also has an association with hip dysplasia. I think about it as little kids squished inside moms with not a lot of room at the end. They get stuck in one position and the muscles tend to get tight. Even though they're born with it, it may take six to eight weeks to notice it more frankly, simply because of then they should start developing some head control and it might be more obvious that they're not really rotating or turning to the other direction. Um, you'll notice as I said, that they're tipped and tilted, and not only are they looking more one way, but it's, after a while they become limited in looking to the other side. And then kind of as I mentioned at the beginning, the asymmetries of the head shape is really usually secondary. Sometimes children can be born with asymmetrical head shapes in addition to the torticollis, the muscle tightness, um, but a lot of times that's secondary, uh, as well as the face, the eyes, ears, and jaw, which we'll get into as to why it's important to actually treat torticollis. Um, just in the history, the breastfed baby may prefer to um, nurse off of one side more than the other because, again, positioning to be able to turn the head to both ways. And you may feel a mass within the actual muscle itself if it's significant enough. When I meet a new mom or dad and baby with torticollis, um, one of the things I ask is how long have they noticed it to really think if it's congenital. And I ask to see cute little baby pictures. And most of the time, even though they may not have noticed it, you can notice it right from pictures from the first few weeks of life. Asking them, do they prefer to look one way? In addition to just the head um, positioning, I also like to ask if there seems to already be any hand or leg preference, because in air quotes, just torticollis, you do wanna make sure in these new babies that you're not missing something on a larger scale, such as a hemiplegia, so thinking of a brain bleed or brain injury, um, or a brachial plexus injury. I've had more than one kid come to me with the concern of torticollis, and on exam, you actually realize one arm or one leg isn't moving moving as well and there's a bigger issue going on there. Um, they tend to answer yes when you ask, oh, when you lay them down to sleep, do they always lay their head in one position? Again, leading us to issues down the road with their head shape. Um, also, same thing if they're sitting in equipment and devices during the day, any type of um, car seat or swing, they'll often be looking in the same direction as you're going through those pictures. Uh, the last thing I like to ask because it's going to come up in my plan is how are they already doing with tummy time? It is never too early to start tummy time with these babies, supervised tummy time during the awake day. Um, and it's nice to know how they're doing already. Again, this isn't necessarily just for the torticollis, but trying to prevent secondary issues. On exam, when I see them, I'm looking for symmetry. If this is a brand new infant, oftentimes there is no asymmetry yet, but as I'm progressively seeing children older, missed or untreated children at one, two, or three years of age, you can start to see asymmetry in the eyes, the ears, the jaw, um, and again, looking to see if there's other issues with symmetry of the arm or leg. The head shape, obviously, if you're stuck looking to one way, 
and you're on your back to sleep and you're spending a large portion of your day sleeping, this can often lead to the head shape malformation or the plagiocephaly that we see as well a lot. Palpating that neck just to get an idea of the muscle stiff, tight, is there any knots or um, scarring in within the muscle itself. Checking their surgical, surgical range of motion. They don't typically like this part, so I save it for last. Having them actually rotate to the other side. You can try this actively by getting their attention, holding them, asking the parents to move around the room, and then as well as actually manually hands-on rotating and lateral bending, seeing if to the other side is tight and if you can get full range. Checking their hips because of the association with hip dysplasia is always important, especially in the younger ones. Um, and then just seeing how it affects their development. We think of torticollis as simply a head and neck issue, um, but I can absolutely tell you that if your child is, or if the patient is really looking only towards one direction, babies only learn what they see. So if they're looking more to the right, they may be using their right arm more. There may be nothing wrong with the left arm. It may not be a hemiplegia. It may not be a brachial plexus injury. But this is a six, seven, eight month old who's only been looking towards the right. You're going to start seeing asymmetries in their arm use. This would affect their rolling skills, their crawling skills, their sitting skills. There are a lot of developmental consequences. Um, can they maintain midline in the older child who maybe has been treated or not 100%, but they can get to that midline? Makes you a little bit less suspicious for skeletal, but not always. Sometimes they can use muscles to compensate. Um, and then when checking for that ocular, um, looking at how they focus on objects up close and far away, I've definitely caught a couple of kids who um, my office looks out over the street, and when they're looking out at the cars running down the road, a 9, 10, 11, 12 month old seems to have no sort of college, and then mom or dad flips them around towards me and we're looking at them closely and the head starts to tilt. And that's a sign to me is there's something ocular going on and they're actually tilting their head for compensation. So treatment, going to that typical muscle protocolis, especially if caught young, um, we can oftentimes start with just some family-based stretching or exercises, laying the baby on the lap or chest for tummy time when they're really little. I, as I said from the beginning, you're never too young for tummy time, supervised floor time, helping them turn their head to each side. You want to position the baby so the head is turned to the non-preferred side. Um, with that being said, I always put the caveat because parents ask me a lot about this, no position or pillows in the crib, nothing to hold their neck in that direction. We're talking daytime, awake, supervised, having them on their stomach and gently turning their head the other way. And then I tell parents, talk, sing, play with the baby, encourage them to turn and face you towards their less preferred side. If they're sleeping in the same bedroom, put the bassinet so that they have to look over the side that they don't prefer to look towards the parent. If they're in their own room, they have to look over the side they don't prefer towards the door. Um, you can, if you're catching it young, you try this for a few weeks, you see them back, they're not doing well or as well as you would like, that's when I would formally get physical therapy involved. And I usually then give them another eight weeks in the young child. If they're improving, great, we continue. One of the things we like to do with physical therapy with torticollis, especially significant torticollis that may have taken a few months to improve, is we do usually give them a bit of time with the therapist. And even if they're doing well, I ask for regular check-ins either with the therapist or myself until they're walking. When children obtain new growth motor skills, a lot of times they'll revert back into that tip. Um, you know, it's almost like they can only focus on one thing at once. Um, and we have caught a few kids who are looking great. They start walking and they needed a little bit of a tune-up and then they're doing well. Hopefully that's the end of it, and then you're done seeing them once they're walking. If they're not improving, that's when we kind of go back through that list of is there anything else going on. Cervical spine x-ray is simple and easy just to check for any vertebral anomalies. Ophthalmology evaluation. And I always check these two things first. Parents frequently come to me for the persistent torticollis, the pediatrician more than can handle one that resolves, looking to know if I think we should do botulinum toxin injections into the sternoclotomastoid, if, if they should be a surgical candidate. And I always say, well, let's make sure we're not missing a reason why they're having the torticollis in the first place. If everything else checks out, then it is something we do. Um, I usually have to sedate these children, and then we um, inject a botulinum toxin or Botox, commonly known, into usually the sternocleidomastoid as well as any other of the surrounding muscles that may have subsequently gotten tight. Um, just from clinical experience, I find the resistant torticollis kids, it's not just the sternocleidomastoid involved by that point because it's been so long. Um, there's a lot of shoulder elevation, um, a lot of scapula out of place, and we Botox that, and then we send them back to therapy for a while. Reserving surgical for the most severe cases, which honestly is not something we have to do often, thankfully. Um, just to touch briefly on that downward effect, if we have an untreated torticollis, these are the things we're looking out for, which is a plagiocephaly, so it's flattening on one side, the side that they're looking towards. 
Um, this can then lead to, and you can see in the picture, an asymmetry in the ear position, a forward frontal uh, bulging or bossing, um, and then obviously the flattening on the back of the head. One of the things parents ask me a lot in that eight or nine month old, right now I have a two year old who has been really hasn't resolved and we're in the process of um, getting him started to do some Botox and the parents are saying, well, what if we leave it alone, what will happen? For a lot of kids, they're totally fine. It's really a minor asymmetry. It's a minor facial discrepancy. I do have a 19 year old girl right now who looks like the gentleman in the middle picture here. It was very untreated. Her eyes are very asymmetric. Her jaw is very asymmetric. I actually do Botox every three months for her now and it's really more for headache relief. Um, and structurally, the face alignment, you know, we can't really realign those eyes. She could do surgical relief um, of the sternocleidomastoid, but it wouldn't really fix the facial asymmetries that have developed over time. So there is, in the severe cases, reasons why we are, you know, continue to aggressively treat it. And my last plug as the physiatrist is to talk about prevention, not of the torticollis, especially if they're born with his congenital, but those downward effects, the delays in the developmental milestones, as well as the plagiocephaly. With back to sleep being the absolute way children have to go to sleep and we can't use positioners, we are fighting an uphill fight for plagiocephaly developing from the torticollis. Tummy time is our biggest um, combat for that, so that's why I harp on it so much. The other thing I talk a lot about, and that's in the therapy literature, but I don't really see it in the medical literature or the physician medical literature, is container baby syndrome. So I have this picture of this cute little baby that's in the car seat. Um, my mantra is car seats are for cars and children who are out of the car should not be in the car seat. Put them in something different, God forbid, carry them. Um, I'm a big crunchy granola proponent of baby wearing. It keeps their head off of something flat in the back. And if you think about it, if it's baby number three or baby number four and they've had to go in non-COVID times to school drop off, uh, practice, run to the grocery store, these babies with torticollis can be stuck in a car seat for like 20, 30 minutes you know, and then drop off and then, oh wait, they're still in it for another hour. And then when you add all those times up, they can be in it for three, four, five hours a day in addition to the time they're spending sleeping. So my last picture, while fuzzy, I apologize, is a beautiful setup that would make my heart sing if I saw my patients, tummy time, working on their skills, even the older child's there. And that's really what I tell parents, especially the young ones, start here. And that will hopefully help us avoid anything more than stretching therapy and hopefully avoid any kind of helmets for flatness. 